Hello and welcome to the 8th Annual Ed Games Expo, a showcase of game-changing innovations in education technology developed through programs across government. Please make sure to check the website for more information on the more than 160 learning games and technologies that are available for educators and students to try out during the month of June and for the lineup of events across the week. Thank you for joining the Ed Games Expo event, highlighting innovations and in training inside the Department of the Navy. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Captain Matt Audette from the United States Marine Corps. Uh, I work out of Marine Corps Systems Command, and there I am the lead for the Marine Maker Movement. Uh, hi, my name is Cheyenne Dwyer. I'm the Senior Director of Experiences at Building Momentum, and I also lead the Naval X efforts on the Building Momentum side with the Department of the Navy. Hi, I am Tom Sullivan. I am the COO of Building Momentum, and I have been a instructional trainer in the Marine Maker Initiative for the last however long it's existed. Hi, my name is Tim Bailey. I'm on the board of directors for Athena Rapid Response Innovation Lab, an Alexandria, Virginia based nonprofit that shows up and does good. I've also worked with Captain Audette, with the Marine Corps, and with DARPA doing innovations in education at the point of need. I'll be moderating the panel today with Cheyenne, Tom, and Matt talking about how across the Department of Defense and the Department of the Navy in particular, new methodologies and tools are enabling a radical change in the way warfighters are trained. Project-based learning and human-centered design are being coupled with rapid prototyping capabilities in barracks, small rooms on bases, commercial innovation facilities, and in traditional military schoolhouses. This allows new skills to be provided directly at the point of need and in a much shorter time frame than legacy training methods had provided. First, we'll kick off with Captain Audette. Matt, would you like to tell us a little bit about what Marine Maker has been doing and how that's been going in the Marine Corps? Yeah, absolutely. So the Marine Maker program is aligned with the Maker movement. So anybody who's familiar with it. And so that problem solving mindset based around technology and producing a physical prototype or an item is what we are baking into the Marine Corps. So we are teaching Marines how to go through and improvise better solutions through critical thinking. So uh, we teach Marines things like CAD and 3D printing and basic programming and microcontrollers and everything you find in a makerspace uh in order for them to go through and start start solving their own problems so we're teaching marines how to improvise solution use improvise solutions using newer technologies uh so the marine corps has a culture of improvisation uh and making things work we are traditionally the as far as our sister services go we get the least amount of funding and our equipment center is the oldest and so Finding a way to make things work in order to accomplish the mission is baked into the Marine Corps culture. And traditionally, those tools we reach into our toolbox to do that with is a lot of duct tape and chewing gum and just sheer grit and willpower. And so what Marine Maker is doing is going through and plussing up that toolkit for the Marines by adding in more modern forms of duct tape, things like CAD and 3D printing, uh, a little bit of programming of microcontrollers, things like Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. So maker skills that the Marines can turn around and then start applying to the problem sets that they have in their lives. Because the Marine at ground level knows the solution, but traditionally they weren't part of the process to come up with a solution beyond describing the problem to an engineer. By going through and putting these skills into their hands and then making them comfortable with it through not just classroom learning, but through project based learning and forcing them to get comfortable very quickly with it. Now they can go through and start solving problems in house and then also teaching each other how to go through and solve these problems. All right, Cheyenne, let's go to you. We'll get the same kind of overview of what Naval X is doing. Then we'll go to Tom and talk about how that training has sort of pieced together. And then we can end with maybe a couple of those anecdotes of here's examples of things that have actually happened or, or ways maybe even that Tom you can talk about how we pivoted a little bit you know in the training or in what we do. Um, so over at Naval X they have a few initiatives that are really pushing different organizations to get hands-on with the problem and not just think about it kind of in the old stuffy Pentagon way. So 
They are have started something called the Center for Adaptive Warfighting or the CAW as it is known, where they are flying around the country and flying around the world and training Marines and warfighters as well as uh, government civilians how to solve problems in a different way. They are using human-centered design, everything from scrum to design thinking to allow them to look at their problem set more holistically and put the warfighter back at the center of their problem, to put the warfighter kind of in the driver's seat to help figure out the solution by going through either scrum training or um, you know, design thinking or whatever it might be. They are able to take some of those tacks back to their office and have more efficient meetings. They're able to get through problem sets faster. And they're able to just really get after the problem in a way that's a little more hands-on than they were able to. And while most of you are probably thinking sticky notes aren't super 21st century tech, this type of thinking is, revolu is revolutionary for the Navy. And it is changing the way that problems are being solved across the board from the warfighters on the ground all the way up to the highest in commands. Um, they have been able to do leadership courses in this and they have Center for Adaptive Warfighting set up everywhere from Okinawa to Alaska to the West Coast, East Coast, and they are just hitting a ton of warfighters all at once from every side that they can with these courses. They also do a lot of facilitation, uh, which they were calling like facilitation on demand. So you are able to bring them your problems and say, hey, you know, this is a problem set I want to work towards. Can you teach me how to do it? And you can bring in your group and they'll teach you how to work through it. Um, those are, are a little more hard to get because obviously they're a, a limited crew over there at Naval X, but they're able to give you the resources and give you the people to go back to, or maybe the people on your command they've already trained to kind of help you lead through your own problem, um, which is really just putting the warfighter and the government workers back at the center of solving problems without, as Matt was saying, leaning on external sources to solve the problems for them. Um, they also are standing up a ton of thing, a ton of programs at organizations called tech bridges. So these are all over the world as well. And these tech bridges are allowing the Navy to reach into industry and find the right answers to the problem sets they're being given. So maybe the problem is a little more, you know, high tech and is a little, a little longer on the acquisition lead time. And they're able to kind of reach into industry and say, how would you guys solve this? And how might we be able to leverage some of those answers and work with small businesses or organizations that we don't typically work with? Um, so Naval X is really leading the, the edge of innovation in a few different ways all over the world um, in, in lots of training and uh, just different acquisition processes that we haven't really seen before. Great, thank you. All right, and Tom. So we've heard about a couple of the innovative training uh, ideas that we've got going from the Marine Corps and from the Navy. So how have you been able to do that training that really transitions from the more traditional classroom style that we may have seen previously to this new on-demand project-based learning uh, that you seem to have been doing that's been working so well? Yeah. So um, that's a really good question. The way that we've sort of introduced challenge-based learning or project-based learning into the training that we've done with the Marine Corps um, has been through in introducing facilitated events like Cheyenne's and um, taking Marines who have been through the traditional training scope and have also been introduced to new technologies the way that Matt has done and throwing them into a, a crucible with regard to generating solutions to projects that have been read, very quickly identified either on base or through command or with our knowledge and the knowledge of the other Marines that are part of the course to not only just go through the um, beat for beat of like a textbook, for example, or beat for beat for a presentation, it's to teach someone how to, for example, the, the theory behind soldering and the do's and don'ts behind it, but then to immediately put a soldering iron in their hand and get them to solder a circuit together. And, and that sort of beat of information at the beginning and then introduction of physical learning and then introduction of project or challenge-based learning on the back end is the, the process in which we've seen the best outcomes from the learning in the DOD with a regard to training the Marine Corps, but then also going further than that and training um, members of DARPA, the Army, um, you know, three-letter agencies and four-letter agencies that 
education from a from a sort of expected educa education level at the beginning through textbook and presentation and then the physical learning of, of getting a muscle memory and getting some reps under your belt and reducing the barrier to entry to the technology and then really making it applicable to the warfighter or to the service member so that you, they actually have a one-to-one -one, um, sort of like ping in the back of their brains they're like this is super important now because it's answering a a, a problem that i had seen and we, you do that everywhere too you know um, with project-based learning and challenge-based learning you you go to the root cause you don't wait for the root cause to come back to you too so when you look at places like um kuwait or qatar uh the bases that we've been to out there but then also um okinawa Hawaii, you know, we've been to the Marine Corps bases there and done training and set up facilities so that you can do the two other steps, because the first step's quite easy, it turns out, like, you know, sending a presentation or, or, or talking on a Zoom call can be quite easy and you can get around the world of doing it in that way. But, you know, um, putting stuff in someone's hands from across the world, especially during the era of COVID, that's sort of how we had to adapt is we sent technology two people in different parts of the on um, different parts of the planet so that we could do the first bit over zoom instruct how to do the second bit over zoom but with the technology that we sent them and then listen and create challenges and get them to be conducted in in situ but over zoom as well so it you don't necessarily have to look at zoom as a barrier to entry but um it kind of can be to some extent too great thanks tom I'm going to pin me for a second. Uh, really quick. Yeah. M Matt, in your government knowledge, is the Navy going to be super pissed? I just talked on this panel as them without them. They're going to assume you work for somebody else in the Navy. You're fine. So okay. there, I there's so many people that work. to freak out that I spoke about Naval X without them. No, there, there's so many people that work in the Navy that it's so non-homogenous. So yeah, there's, you're, you're fine. Okay. Yep. Great. I'll subtitle you all also. Um, yeah, just, I'm just, what I have done with Naval X is all of this stuff, not I am, I am speaking on behalf of them. <laughs> and you're being very clear in your language that they okay, are good. doing these things. Great. So I've been- Just wanna make listening. sure. Yeah. So thanks for those overviews. Uh, it's fascinating to hear how project-based learning has been implemented in different ways across the DOD and specifically through the Department of the Navy. I feel like it's interesting to hear how the mental side of creating these leadership courses and then immediately attacking problems using post-it notes is one type of project-based learning that we think about using this new technology in your mind. And then we also have the physical technology that you're using of 3D printers or laser cutters or other you know, soldering irons and those kinds of technologies that are also used in projects. Um, Matt, I would love to hear some of the, specifically some of the ways that using those small projects with the physical technology has created impacts in the Marine Corps that were different than what you might have seen if you used a traditional classroom style format where you go through a long weeks or months long training program uh, to get somebody ready to actually interface with hardware. Yeah, I'd be happy to do so. So I will say that one of our approaches with it being project-based learning and why we need to take that approach versus a more traditional classroom-based uh, learning is that Marines typically don't respond to the classroom-based learning. Uh, there are people who join the Marine Corps, but there, there are plenty who are capable of learning within a classroom. Um, but there's also a, a number of people who join the Marine Corps because school does not interest them. Um, for whatever reason, they're not looking to go and learn in a classroom. And in the early days of additive manufacturing, we took a much more professorial approach to trying to teach these skills to the Marines and they did not respond to it. And because a lot of the Marines that are, a lot of the Marines and the younger ones tend to be hands-on learners, uh, audio-visual learners. And so by going through and putting things directly into their hands and then immediately giving them problems to solve with it, you get results a lot faster. Uh, and the Marines respond to it a lot better too. And this is also one of those things where one of the, because there are so many things in the, in the military that are dangerous or more risky than you would typically find, uh, we tend to get a lot of training on doing something before we do it. And then what the 
in, inadvertent result of this is if we have a Marine do something that they weren't explicitly trained to do, they become very uncomfortable very quickly. They'll turn around and be like, uh, I don't, I don't do X because I do Y. Nobody has taught me how to do Y. And we need to break Marines of this habit uh, because the, the most critical six inches on the battlefield are the space in between your ears. You need to, you need to be able to, uh, the best type of Marine is a problem solver. And they don't go through and limit themselves by going, nobody taught me how to do this, therefore I just throw my hands up. They got to roll up their sleeves and be comfortable enough to do this. And so we teach them to be comfortable with these new technologies by making them very uncomfortable in the training. The touch time to do time on this is pretty minimal. And a lot of the Marines are very shocked because uh, Tom can attest to this in the training. We go through, we teach them CAD and then within not hours, uh, you could measure it in, in minutes before the training goes through and we start throwing problems at them. And the first thing they got is build me a bridge. Excellent. How do you want your bridge built? No, you got to design the bridge. And you can see the gears lock up on some people. You get that real, oh no face. And then there's the, there's other Marines that go, oh, you're not going to tell me how to do it. Finally, I am. someone's going to allow me to think and respond to this. And so we, we see both ends of the spectrum on that. And that's why we take that project-based learning by making them uncomfortable and just lobbing problems at them, which is realistic by nothing ever works out the first time. And it's not who has the best plans. How do you, how do you react and improvise when things go wrong? Um, so we start seeing a lot of Marines tackling things that are not within their wheelhouse uh, because they are comfortable with the technology enough to go through and somebody puts a problem in their lap and instead of the typical Marine Corps response of, hey, I don't work on artillery pieces, I am a truck driver, and we have Marines going, you know what? I know CAD and I know 3D printing and this is a pretty simple problem. Your box is broken. I'm going to make you a better box even though I'm a truck driver. And so... Uh, we see a lot of things like that, where we'll have Marines that are generator mechanics submitting problems that their roommate, who happens to be a combat engineer who is describing, I need a better hook for this piece of gear. We see a lot of that cross-pollination uh, with that, and they're not afraid to stray out of their lanes because while they might be unfamiliar with the problem, if they can have another Marine describe it to them, they're familiar enough with the problem-solving process so they can jump into it. And we see that a lot with additive manufacturing. That's a real gateway to this because the uh, it's easy to go from clicking in CAD to turning into holding a physical product in our hand. And some of our better Marines who are at that who are more comfortable with people bringing them problems over and over and over, and they're just getting reps in on solving by going through and making physical widgets. Eventually, someone brings them, hey, we've got this old piece of gear from the 70s, and the circuit card is broken. We can't fix this with a 3D printer. And they go, well... I've got some copper clad into a steady hand and a Dremel, and I have been taught basic circuitry. So let's see if we can just go through and, and reverse engineer it. And so we, we we start to see things like that, where Marines are going through and taking gear that was originally fielded in the 70s, supposed to be obsoleted in the 90s, and now we're 50 years into its life cycle, and it's hard to find these repair parts, and the Marines, it's broken, and they go, you know what? I might as well try. So that, if we want more specific use cases, I'd be happy to dive in. But I know Tom's got a bunch of use cases, and, and Tom and Cheyenne have a boatload of use cases. Like they could talk through the training piece of the Marines. That first initial contact with something goes wrong, and then you have now the real training starts is you have to start thinking on the fly. So, Tom, do you have any uh, specific instances where you've seen that project based learning sort of unlock somebody uh, the way that Matt was talking about? Yeah, there there are a few uh, there are a few that come to mind. Um, we have trained uh, multiple people in uh, California and Okinawa who have been able to, through our training and through the challenge based learning of um, sort of like showing the beginning of the road and then letting them really run down it for the rest of the way. Um, have come up with solutions. Um, there was a in, there was an environment where um, we fielded a collection of three D printers to Kuwait um, a few years ago, and there is a um, there was an item inside the inside the Marine Corps called an eighty one millimeter mortar tube, and there is a firing pin at the bottom of it, and that firing pin can sometimes get stuck and or break, um, and the solution that we had heard was that instead of um, 
being able to remove the firing pin because the wrench was missing. Marines were carrying just two tubes. So a tube, imagine a very large piece of like, you know, four, four inch round PVC piping with concrete in it. Like that is a mortar tube, um, weight and size. So they were carrying two of those opposed to carrying two pocket knives. So because the wrench didn't exist. So, and the wrench that um, came with the um, piece of equipment was a steel, you know, die cut, you know, eighth inch thick steel wrench. And that wasn't fielded for some reason or, or, or wasn't with the systems when they were, when they were in Kuwait. So uh, one of the Marines that we trained put the profile into Fusion 360, printed that profile and then um, beefed it up. So instead of it being an eighth inch thick and they mean made it two and a half inches thick and put it at hundred percent infill and it took 36 hours to print, but it printed, but God damn it. And then turn that wrench and the pin could come out. And that ability to look at something that is flat and made out of one material and go, well, I can just beef it up. Like, you know, beefing stuff up is pretty easy. We just can go ahead and make it thicker and increase the infill and we should be pretty good to go. And then fielding it and testing it, it is much easier on the human body and much easier with regard to uh, the mechanics of the system to take a 3D printed wrench or even if the 3D printed plastic wrench fails after one use, take two wrenches rather than taking your concrete filled four inch round PVC like mortar tube. So it just made a lot more sense to, you know, that, that sort of um, challenge, the identification of a challenge and then the, the pivoting of looking at a way to solve it in a different manner. Um, that's one of them. And, and like to talk to the challenge-based learning too, you know, like the, the introduction of challenge-based learning in, into these environments is not necessarily, uh, uh, it's not a new concept, but it is a concept in which it has become far more, I think, um, accepted in education uh, in any level doesn't need to be DOD specific it can be literally like across the board challenge based learning I think has become more um, accepted and more like brought back into into classroom environments I understand why it wasn't right like I, I, I get that from an education standpoint it's nice to have a collection of uh, like wickets or nice to have a collection of tests that you can grade everyone on that have a yes or no answer associated to them um, and challenge-based learning is, is, is not that. It, instead of a multi-choice you know, a, a multi question where you get one of four options, you're asking someone to, in essence, write a four-page essay. But because not everyone is a great essay writer, really what you're doing is asking people to do four entirely different day-long events and then evaluating, on them, uh, evaluating them on those events. And that can be really difficult to grade. It can be really difficult to gauge success. It can be really difficult to, to sort of have a definitive outcome on the back end of it that, you know, this person is a good problem solver or this person did pass this class. But I think as the appetite for having those more in-depth conversations with students is risen because a lot of people, like Matt said, a lot of people don't learn the traditional way anymore. I mean, I didn't learn the traditional way. I have... I have and had massive amounts of issues with ADHD and dyslexia that I would have never been able to do the things that I did if I wasn't given the opportunity to do challenge-based learning, that I could prove that I could develop solutions to the problems that I was seeing in front of me because I was doing it physically rather than writing a four-page essay that I will tell myself would never have made sense from a grammar or language standpoint, but because I could show my process and the physical output from it, it made far more sense that someone could turn around and say, yes, that person did actually develop a solution to it. And when you look inside the services with the wrench, for example, or even, you know, some of the UAS um, drone systems that we've developed for the Marine Corps or in tandem with the Marine Corps have, have built classes for them. If you would expect someone to pass a part 107 FAA license to be able to fly a drone on, on a military installation, they might fail that test every day. But if you give someone the opportunity to build a drone and have a better understanding of how a drone exists in three-dimensional, four-dimensional space and how it operates and how to you know, build it and how to fly it appropriately and then ask them to take the test, the likelihood of that person passing that test after going through the challenge-based learning of building the system is infinitely higher because they now have a physical understanding of what those 
multiple choice questions actually relates to rather than it just being good at taking tests. That's that's one of the things when I was uh, supporting programs at DARPA that we actually uh, were trying to work on, which was how do you do tools and training at the point of need? So in the mentor program that I was supporting, we looked at a variety of different things. One of them was installing fab labs and equipment inside of DOD facilities, which is where the Marine Maker uh, program and some of these training uh, things came from. But a lot of it was, was using that project-based learning mindset, exactly like you said, Tom. We need to get people actually hands-on with the problem and with developing the solution and then maybe they could go through and do some traditional assessment. But a lot of what we were trying to look at was if someone can solve the problem, do they need to be certified in some way or have an external entity approving their capability if they've already proven it, right? You know, if you can model and 3D print something, do you need to be a certified uh, modeler and 3D printer? Do you need to have someone else check a box that says, yes, you know how to use CAD? Probably not because you just did it, right? If you, can, if you can put the pieces together, you're certified to put the pieces together because you did it. And, and I think that's a really key thing that most people miss about project-based learning is it proves that you can do the thing, whether or not you could pass the standardized test that's used to evaluate it, you've now proven that you can do that, uh, that task no matter who's doing the evaluation on it. But I know that's a little bit harder sometimes for, for things that aren't a physical uh, artifact. Um, Cheyenne, can you tell us a little bit about the, the facilitation that, that Naval X is doing um, and the way that the, the design thinking programs that they're doing and exercising uh, are similar in that way that they, it's a still a do a thing but it's got a different flavor to it than what we usually see when we're thinking of a physical technology in hand kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough as a building momentum employee to kind of sit in the middle of watching this from all angles. I get to watch Marine maker training happen and the great hands-on learning. And I get to watch and help facilitate the Naval X training that happens a lot of the times. And the cool thing about the human centered design, design thinking type training is that we all have been, especially during COVID, bored by meetings, you know, meetings nonstop from 8 a.m. Till, till you go to sleep that night. And things can happen in a meeting, but you're going to hear a lot of the same voices. You know, you're going to hear person of, especially in the Navy, person of highest command, person who feels the strongest, or person who is, quote unquote, the expert in that thing. Um, and human-centered design and design thinking allows you to kind of take that out of the equation because everyone has a pad of sticky notes and everyone has a pen in the room. There is no, this sticky note holds more weight than this sticky note because the commander happened to write it or the admiral happened to write it. Everyone's on an equal playing field. So it kind of allows everyone to get hands-on with the problem and for you to throw up a huge amount of answers to your problem. It's not just, we're gonna converge and root ourselves in the very first answer that the admiral said, and that's our answer. It's let's take a solid, you know, if it's a two hour activity, we're going to take half an hour to 45 minutes and we're going to diverge on a lot of different solutions. And then together as a group vote on the solution we should move forward with. Um, we're not going to get, you know, rooted in one of those solutions immediately just because it's the first thing that was said that sounded kind of okay. Um, it also allows people to, you know, get the bad ideas out. One of my favorite activities is bad idea brainstorm only. Like, I want you to tell me only the worst ways you can think to solve this problem. I don't want to hear good answers right now. Because once those are out of your mind, we can actually get past that barrier of entry and actually start thinking of new solutions. Um, and Naval X, from what I've been able to watch, is doing an amazing job at that, at getting people in a different mindset, whether it be through hands-on, you know, even just standing up in a meeting instead of sitting is suddenly hands-on, right? Like suddenly I'm in a different mindset because you took away my chair. Um, so maybe I'm angry you took away my chair, but now I'm actually paying attention to what's going on because I'm not at my computer. I don't have my cell phone. I'm not doing whatever else is distracting me, which especially during COVID has been so challenging and they've done a great job of making it also virtual. So that way, if, you know, we can't all gather in a room together with physical sticky notes, we can still do some online platforms that get at the same objectives, um, which has been, been really cool to watch. And really the, the confidence and permission you see of the quieter people in the room who suddenly are like, oh, I put up one sticky note and no one told me I was dumb. 
oh, I put up another one and no one told me to leave the, like, oh, I can keep putting up sticky notes. The Admiral's listening, whoever is listening, and I'm not getting told to stop. I'm going to go for it. And kind of by the end of the day, you see them flower into this whole other, you know, confidence of I can help solve problems. Even if I'm not an engineer or it's not my expertise, I can still throw up answers that could be valid. Um, and design thinking really allows for that. So one of the things that you touched on, Cheyenne, was that it creates a level playing field when we do some of these project-based learning activities. And I noticed with all of us, we're very casual. And I think this era of, of being online and not being in an office has created a casual environment, but it also does level the playing field a bit when everybody is a little bit more casual, there's a little bit less formality to the things that are going on. And project-based learning has that same effect on people. You have to sort of, which is unusual inside of the DOD and inside of a military rank structure, strip away some of those qualifications and some of that ranking and some of that division between I'm an engineer, I'm a cook, I'm an administrative assistant and empower people to go through and have ideas that get put up on the board, the same as their commanding officer or their, their supervisor. Um, try something out and print it out or just make a circuit because they can, even if that's not their job, even if that's not the system that they've been trained on. And I think that the project-based learning environment really invites people to step outside their comfort zone and especially outside of their traditional social and, and sort of structural uh, confines to really be able to explore something more fully and learn in a completely different way and unfettered uh, by their uniform or by their rank or by their title. Uh, Matt, have you seen that specifically uh, implemented in a way inside the Marine Corps that was really useful or has there been any pushback on that when you've had people that came in in uniform and said, well, I've got to take off my rank here and just be me and not have all this, you know, the things that I've earned over the years. I've earned these stripes. I've, I've earned these oak leaves, but now I don't get to use them as just carte blanche to have my way with things. Have you seen people push back against that in some of these scenarios? Uh, especially in the early days when we were starting up the program, yes, uh, because it is one of those things where uh, there's always a bit of culture shock and it always comes from the higher up folks because those, those who are on the on the lower end of the, the rank structure was, oh, we're all wearing civilian attire and we're using call signs instead of last names and rank. They're all for it, as they should be. Uh, and then there's always a, a, there's always a little bit of timidity on the part of the higher ranking folks because it's uh, it's new it's different i will say over over time we've gotten better because our, our training has developed a bit of a reputation because of that and so so thanks to the hard work of folks like cheyenne and tom people know now what to expect and that it is coming in that good ideas are not tied to rank uh good ideas and expertise are not tied to time and service when we're looking at problems and the diversity of backgrounds is a handy thing to have because because we're all trained in the same places all of the same artillerymen think like artillerymen, engineers think like engineers, logisticians think like logisticians. And having that outside mindset of somebody who has not been in the institution for a long time and is not from your specific background, look at your problem and go, why don't you just blank? And then every once in a while you get a, it's a great question, why don't we just do that? And so, uh, whatever reservations people have at the beginning of training towards the end everybody's all on board um and so in certain places in the marine corps people are more comfortable with it than others uh because we do have specialists where certain jobs in the marine corps will find the ranking person is lance corporal someone with you know two to three years of experience and they're the technical experts and they got to be they got to their word is is the standard and so those people tend to be a little bit more ready to jump into that um but in other places where uh, you tend to travel in in large, large packs of the same job, it tends to be a bit more uh, uh, hierarchical in it. And it takes a little bit more time to break them of it. But once, you, just with everything in the Marine Corps, once you can show the utility to somebody, they tend to get over their reservations and turn around to start implementing it because it gets results. And that's what we all care about. And I think it's fun to recognize that it's not just the 
the lance corporals that are getting this training either, that these trainings are being pushed across all ranks uh, and all kinds of people uh, inside of the Marine Corps and inside of the Navy so that you never have just one, uh, you know, like one level of training. I, I tend to think of project-based learning as these are the students and then they'll graduate and be the professionals, but really we're, we're having the professionals everywhere. Um, so Tom, is there a, uh, have, you, have you seen anything? What's a good way to put this? Have you seen any place where you were in a training and doing the project had an impact on somebody, like one of those where it's across ranks, where somebody who sh maybe, sh I won't say should have known better, but have you seen an instance where it was surprising to someone of a higher rank that they learned something or that they were able to acquire a new skill uh, inside of the training that they assumed might have been mostly aimed at someone that was for a lower rank or of a lesser experience category? Yeah, I think the, the best example for that is um, over a year ago now, we held the General Officer Symposium for the Marine Corps at our facility in Virginia. And part of that was that we took our superstars of the Marine Maker Initiative. So we brought in 40, 50 Marines from everywhere around the globe. It was like, wasn't just local to Quantico, it was literally the gambit. We had people who were flown off of ships to come to this thing uh, from the Marine Corps side. And we told them that they were going to be at stations that the general officers would walk around. So one for CAD, one for electronics, one for animatronics and robotics one for drones, so UAS, one that's flying and also taking them out of the sky. And we skilled them up on, you know, refreshed their memories and, and, and sort of gave them a script and talking points to go to um, for each of the uh, stations. And the people on those stations were, majority of them were, were NCOs. You're looking at, you know, privates all the way up to master guns and, and so on and so forth at those stations. And then what happened was that the general officers came around, you know, many many stars and 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 you know all, all of the ranks that you would expect from the from the officers cohort came through and went through all of these stations and i think at every single one of those stations there was an element of surprise that the number of marines that could do all of the things that were being done at those stations was as high as it was the appetite for that learning and the way that that learning was conducted was so strong at each of those stations and then each of those stations there were multiple scenarios where i remember viewing and seeing as matt said like a lance corporal who is an incredible drone pilot leaning over and and like teaching general Berger how to like fly a drone right like that that is something that is is so that would have never happened if challenge-based learning didn't exist or the environment in which challenge-based learning enables that person to show off a skill or to show off a, a solution to a problem like that, that interaction would have never existed because you might have written a, uh, you might have written a report that could have gone across a general's table. You might have done a sit rep that could have been pushed up the chain and that might have eventually been read by someone but i don't think there was ever been a situation where that person would have been able to lean over and say well sir if you flick this switch it actually controls a system that's on the drone that we fielded that you're trying to take out with a t-shirt cannon and it will actually drop something and then for that cross rank cross edu like platform education to exist is is staggering to me that i think it could only really have been attained through uh, project-based or challenge-based learning and then Cheyenne, uh, I'm assuming that you probably uh, have had the, the similar experience uh, using uh, design thinking and, and sticky notes. Um, I love your, your description that everybody has a pen and a sticky note and no one's sticky note is uh, of a higher ranking uh, <laughs> when you put up a sticky note. Um, have you seen that specifically play out uh, in, in these project-based you know, real world scenarios that, that you've been pushing forward uh, or seen inside of Naval X? Yeah, so uh, recently, this isn't exactly a Naval X example, but this is with the joint uh, group of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that I had over recently through Building Momentum to do a facilitation event. And 
we are facilitating to talk through with General Maxwell's group to talk through some logistics promises they were making as J4. And we were able to put up a bunch of big sheets of paper and bring in numerous generals. And everyone was able to have a voice and talk about what their concerns were about these promises and talk about things. And then when the highest ranking general rolled in to get an overview, he was able to walk around to all those sticky notes, ingest it all, take it all and ask targeted questions. But he didn't then go through and say, you know, oh, scratch all these sticky notes. These are all bad. This is the only one I'm worried about. He was able to actually look at it and say, wow, you know, you guys are doing real work about this. He could see in live time the thinking that they were going through with those promises. Not to say that a general doesn't believe his group is doing the work they're supposed to. He absolutely does. But he was able to actually see it up on a board. He was able to see, oh, you guys are thinking of every scenario that could happen one week, three months, and six months from now with these promises we're making. So they were really able to dive in and he was able to see, oh, we're not just, you know, sitting here having fun with sticky notes, doing some welding, having a little bit of fun. We're actually diving into this in a really meaningful way that's going to get us the best result on the back end. Um, and, you know, I've had some great experiences with generals or admirals going through full days of facilitation with us and really, really being side by side, but sometimes they can't always, and that's okay. But when they're able to, at the end of the day, come in and see a room of sticky notes, they say, okay, I do trust that you guys really thought through every single thing that could have happened because I see it. I see that you looked at every single scenario that could have happened with what we're talking about. And then they can outbrief him or her and say, you know what, we, you're in good hands because look at all the work we've done. It's not just a bunch of Outlook meetings that no one, you only can see meeting agendas from. It is truly, we, we're showing you what we did, um, which is a really great way for commanders or, I mean, we have it at Building Momentum. It's a great way for our CEO to walk in and be like, oh, wow, you guys are really thinking about this. Look at all these stickies. Um, it's a great way to show all the work that's going into a problem set. I think sometimes the, the sticky notes and design thinking gets lost when we're, when we're thinking about um, project-based learning, just because it's hard to conceptualize what a project looks like that's not a physical item. Uh, so it's, it's great to hear some of the, uh, the facilitation pieces that you can do where you can still lay that out and have it be a physical artifact of the thinking that's going on inside somebody's head and how much that helps just show, uh, like we're, we're constantly iterating, this is the exact same prototyping process we'd go through on a 3D printer, but now we're going through it with sticky notes and we're going through it with process design, um, but it's still, everybody is on board, everybody's uh, you know, participating in the process up until we present it to our final, uh, you know, almost like the final exam, like, oh, here, now you can see the process we went through to get to it. It's not an essay, it's not the, you know, the, the notes from the meeting, it's actually everything that happened uh, that's still happening. And we're gonna keep iterating on this as we go along. Yeah, a really, Tim, to hit on something, a really cool thing Naval X does, the Center for Adaptive Warfighting, they teach a warfighter-centered de design class. And the end of that is they work through, all day they work through a problem, and at the end of it, they do like a shark tank of all the ideas and they present it. And they always, if they can, they try to bring in higher ranking officials from the base to see these ideas that these uh, Marines have come up with and, or, you know, sailors or whoever they're working with. And some of those ideas have actually been implemented. They, you know, the Colonel or whoever is on base will say, oh, you know, we never thought if you just do this in the lunchroom at X, Y, Z, that's a great idea. Let's do it tomorrow. Um, because, and they just, it's just a different way to get new ideas out that no one has seen. Um, and that, kind of hands-on shark tank that Nablex has been able to adopt really allows all those problems to get out pretty quickly um, and in a pretty efficient time span in a way that hasn't been able to happen before. Awesome. All right, Matt, I feel like we should probably end with you. So Matt, we've talked about how project-based learning uh, has influenced the Department of the Navy, both in Nablex and in the Marine Corps with Marine Maker. What's the future look like for project-based learning? And is there anything coming up or coming out of the Marine Corps that you can talk about that's based on some of these project-based learning principles or that's just emerged organically from the training that you've been doing in this way? Yeah, so one of the, one of the things we always get told in the Marine Corps, and it's a very popular quote, is that training prepares us for the known, education prepares us for the unknown. 
And right now, the Marine Corps is undergoing a modernization effort that we haven't seen since the end of World War II uh, and, or the interwar period. And so as we go through and we reinvent ourselves from the ground up, uh, and there's no sacred cows, we can change whatever we need to. And we've, we've made some pretty drastic changes to the uh, the to the to the way the Marine Corps operates. We've realized that what needs to change is not just better gear. We don't need, it's not just a gear set problem. It's also an education and mindset problem and how we train those individuals and how we highlight those who are up taking on the training and not those who are just regurgitating facts that were laid out in front of them. So moving more towards more project-based education uh, is it's the way of the future for, for the Marine Corps. It has been identified as something that needs to change uh, from the ground up and it's starting to be implemented all over the Marine Corps through at unit levels, through experimentation uh, within the schoolhouses at the entry level where we are trying new things for, for the Marines of not just your, here's a PowerPoint, we're going to learn it. And then there's a written test at the end of it. We're going to go out and we're going to try things and you're going to come back and you're going to tell us what worked. So it's, it's the way of the future for how we make the Marine Corps better. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. I appreciate your insights uh, and and your stories uh, from the field. I feel like project-based learning is, is one of those education opportunities that really provides a lot of examples of things that work. Um, and so it's good to get a little bit of insight into how those have been happening. Thank you all for your facilitation and for your participation in the panel. Also for just making sure that we have better trained warfighters, that the DOD writ large uh, is really on the forefront of pushing through and, and looking at how best to empower warfighters uh, and our decision makers in, in the field and at home. Uh, and I think project-based learning is one of the ways that we're learning. It's not the only thing that you can use. Uh, there's certainly room uh, for traditional schoolhouse learning and for really deep knowledge that can only be assessed through uh, standardized testing and through some of those essays that Tom doesn't want to write. But including project-based learning as potentially a way to, you know, to enter into some of those ideas and some of those concepts can be a really important way for us to move forward. So thank you all. I appreciate you being here and I hope everybody has fun with the rest of the Ed Games Expo. Have a great day.